If he's not able to join first, should we go ahead and just start with Tara? What do you think, Tara? So I'm okay to give it a couple of minutes if you'd like, Anne, because I know Mike said he wanted to go first. And if not, I'm happy to start. What do you think? Let's, let's give him one minute. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We are just having a bit of technical issues. Um, so if you could just give us about a minute and we're going to try to work through those. Thanks for your patience. Well, I guess while we wait for Mike to um, come online, figured we'll start with a um, introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to our symposium, uh, the spotlight session, UTC paves the way for transportation, air quality, and health. Uh, my name is Ann Shu. I am assistant director for technology for CAR-T. Um, at, at TTI, and I am really honored to have my wonderful panelists today. Um, the, the lead uh, from each of our member universities, the, the, also the leaders and experts in the field. Um, today we will, um, we'll, we were going to start with Georgia Tech, uh, my, Dr. Michael, Mike Rogers from Georgia Tech. So we would like to talk about teaching and uh, fostering the next generation of leaders first, but it looks like he's having a bit of a technical issue. Uh, so we will go with uh, Dr. Tara Ramani, and she will be talking about the research um, themes in um, at CAR-T, the, the, our research agenda for transportation emissions, health and beyond. So the floor is yours, Tara. Thank you, Anne. Let me just get my slides up. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, so I guess at CAR-T, I sort of wear two hats. So I work as a researcher and a lot of the work I do is in the area of transportation air quality health and sustainable transportation. Um, but at CAR-T, I also serve as the assistant director for research, um, in, wherein I work with the rest of CAR-T leadership to sort of coordinate and manage our research agenda. So that is sort of the hat that I'm wearing when I speak to you all today. Um, and what I'm going to do is just provide a general look at how CAR-T has sort of evolved and worked on a research agenda for transportation emissions, energy and health, as well as going beyond that. So, you know, just, just to start off, I did want to open with some acknowledgements. So CAR-T is a university transportation center funded by the US Department of Transportation. 
And we are a consortium of five universities or university-based research institutes um, across the US. And um, you will be hearing from all um, CAR-T partner universities in the session as well as throughout the rest of the symposium. So because I am speaking about CAR-T's research agenda, the overall direction and themes are things that sort of cut across the work done by all our partners. Um, however, some of the specific projects that I will talk briefly about, so I'm not doing a deep dive into any single research project, um, are those that are done at TTI um, or Texas A&M, with TTI being the lead institution of car -T. Um, so I would like to acknowledge some of my colleagues at TTI whose work is um, featured here and who are making great contributions to CAR-T. Uh, firstly, the director of our center, Dr. Joe Zietzman, um, and then my colleagues and team members at CAR-T, Andrew, my counterpart, who's the director of technology or assistant director of technology and moderating our session, um, Hanin Kreis, Ben Ettelman, and several other staff and students who are working on CARTI's projects. So firstly, I wanted to speak a little bit about the motivation for us to um, pursue and set up a center, pursue funding for it and set up a center like CARTI. Um, so really, we wanted to advance interdisciplinary research um, related to transportation emissions and health. And, Starting out uh, for folks like me who maybe five or ten years ago were working in the area of transportation air quality, um, we pretty much would focus on emissions, uh, mostly emissions coming out of internal combustion engine vehicles, right? And um, when we talk about air quality improvements or emissions reduction, it primarily dealt with either um, improving emissions at an individual vehicle level through you know retrofits or engine improvements whatever else or my slides just okay or um, uh, or um, you know looking at a transportation network and figuring out how we could optimize or reduce uh, network level emissions However, um, we also saw this kind of uh, shift in paradigm in how these issues were being addressed. So while the air is getting cleaner and vehicles are getting cleaner, as, as we saw in the keynote session and, and in many discussions, the fact is there's still more work to be done. You know, firstly, in the context of decarbonization and climate change. Secondly, there is more evidence of disparities in exposure that need to be addressed and the fact that uh, traditional air monitoring networks do not necessarily characterize the true exposure that people are facing and the related health impacts. Um, and, and this coupled with uh, changes in transportation and electrification of transportation, etc., all sort of gave rise to the need to address the issue of emissions and transportation in, in sort of a more uh, holistic and integrated manner. So that's kind of why we started out with addressing what we call the tailpipe to lungs, the full chain between air pollution um, it's, uh, or transportation attributable emissions and the dispersion and exposure and resultant health impacts. Um, another thing that we really took into consideration as we thought about research that car -team wants to advance is that as a university-based transportation center, not only do we have a research mission to fulfill, but we also have education and technology transfer goals to meet. So not only should we um, align our work to educate the future workforce, but also um, make sure that the work that we are doing, the research that we are doing can result in uh, you know, supporting policy and decision making. So with, with this in mind, I wanted to briefly talk about some of the selected projects that we undertook at car -T, specifically at TTI. Um, a lot of these project reports or research products are available on car -T's website, on car -T's data hub, or will be published or made available shortly. Um, so, so these projects are just a sampling of ones that sort of speak to different aspects of transportation air quality and health that we've been working on. 
Uh, for example, the first study listed there is a study that looked at personal exposure to air pollution in the US-Mexico border area. So in the area of El Paso, Texas, um, which is um, you know, located near a very heavily trafficked US-Mexico border crossing, we recruited some school teachers and did um, personal exposure monitoring to these teachers who live and work in areas near the border crossing. Um, and the findings did indicate, um, we, we had a few interesting findings, including that they had elevated exposure levels uh, relative to their home and commutes at school, and that um, the ambient monitors did not often pick up uh, on or did not show the same levels of exposure as the personal monitoring did indicate. Um, another study that was not so measurement based but was modeling based was looking at potential exposures of dockless mobility users, so like the e-scooter users in the city of Austin. So this work sort of overlaid um, the transportation network emissions and the emission profiles over the travel and, and routes and travel information um, that we obtained um, from usage of these e-scooters and we were able to make some assessments of exposure. Um, another study that might be further down the chain of the full chain to the health area was a burden of disease assessment, assessing um, the burden of disease with regards to childhood asthma attributable to traffic-related air pollution. Um, and then another study that we undertook, or another um, project that we undertook that sort of put all of these together was the development of a full chain emissions modeling platform. So the idea was to be able to take transportation models, um, integrate that with the emissions modeling, the dispersion modeling, and the health assessment piece into an integrated pipeline. So on the screen over there, um, you see the term parts and like a screen grab of this platform. So it's a platform to assess transportation health and sustainability. So we've used it to analyze the air quality and uh, health impacts of some transportation scenarios. And our vision for this tool is to potentially expand it to other transportation and health outcomes as well, which I will be talking about a little further on the next slide. Um, and finally, another type of work that I wanted to highlight is um, work that we are doing to synthesize the literature and um, make it sort of uh, and, and, and sort of put the evidence together to help policymakers and practitioners understand uh, um, strategies that could be used for mitigating air quality. So specifically, in this case, we are doing a systematic map which is quite similar to a systematic review um, of the evidence relating to different interventions, basically urban area strategies that could mitigate or uh, reduce traffic related air pollution. So this particular um, project is underway and in addition to this systematic review output, we're also going to create a database that is aimed at practitioners um, and we hope to have this work out in, in the coming months as well. So, so these studies that I've talked about mostly are in across that full chain, talking about emissions and health. And this is a big part of what CARTI started out with at the outset. Um, moving forward, though, what we also have started to do is to put these um, research you know, findings about emissions, energy, and health into a broader context. So here, um, just a couple of examples. The first one is saying that emissions and health interlinkages are one of many transportation and health linkages. So we worked on um, a conceptual model working with collaborators both within and outside of CAR-T um, what we call transportation and health pathways. So um, this is a comprehensive model that identifies 14 possible pathways that link health and transportation, of which some are beneficial to health and, and are health promoting while others are detrimental. And the idea is that in addition to quantifying um, the burden of uh, disease due to uh, air pollution, we could potentially quantify the health impacts of other strategies as well. And some of this work is also being featured uh, in other sessions of the symposium. 
another um, interesting piece of work that we're doing to sort of address this bigger context, go beyond transportation emissions as such, is coupling the transportation um, modeling and the, the electricity grid modeling. And obviously, this is important in the context of transportation electrification, which is increasingly being seen as a necessary strategy to tackle climate change and to decarbonize transportation. Um, so this is work that CARTI, led by Anju, um, was doing with Texas A&M University Smart Grid Center. So there are some findings here that which are quite interesting, which really show that there is a net emissions benefit if electric vehicle charging is sort of included within in the context of Texas in the Texas grid. And these are some findings which we are hoping to showcase in a webinar, um, a CARTI webinar in the coming months. So these are some examples of where we put things in, put the emissions and health topic in the broader context of transportation and health. So finally, the next piece um, sort of alludes to what um, Joe Zietzman was mentioning during the opening session, which is putting these pieces together in the context of emerging issues. And, and really, we have identified infrastructure as a big one, because that is a way by which we can, um, we can help promote decision making that supports you know, addressing or optimizing these transportation and health pathways. But another also is the concept of equity, which is sort of a cross-cutting issue that needs to be addressed because it's not just about health benefits or disbenefits, but really who is benefiting and who is not from these. So um, we are working on a framework which links infrastructure and health equity with the idea being that we can use the transportation health pathways as a lens to promote decisions on infrastructure um, that could that also meet you know the other infrastructure goals so um, our idea is so we are collaborating with texas a and its center for infrastructure renewal to address these health and equity issues over the infrastructure life cycle um, and we also want to put together, or we are working on putting together some practitioner guidance and a toolkit that can help um, decision makers and policy makers think through potential health and equity aspects related to infrastructure decisions, starting from the aspects of material selection, um, all the way down to the planning, the construction, um, maintenance as well as the disposal or end of life of this life cycle. So um, this is something that we are working on and we hope to have findings available in the coming months. We are also doing a few pilot studies that uh, sort of relate to this framework and this concept. Um, so, so in conclusion, really uh, what I wanted to communicate here is how we have sort of evolved in CAR-T to move beyond addressing, or I shouldn't say move beyond because transportation emissions and energy consumption, right? These are a vital issue that needs to be studied and researched and addressed further because there's more work to be done. Um, that being said, uh, we do believe in the value of putting this in the bigger context, right? That emissions is a big major pathway, but only one of the many pathways linking transportation and health. And ultimately, as we start addressing these, we also need to think about how can we make decisions that better support um, improving transportation health outcomes. So, so that's kind of uh, you know what I wanted to leave you with, just a, a discussion of description of how um, CAR-T is trying to advance research, not just in emissions and energy and health, but beyond that as well. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. That's a really good overview of our research agenda. Um, we see, we have um, Mike Rogers online on the line yet. We do. Oh, wonderful. All right, this is perfect. So Mike, Tara just gave a great overview of um, the research agenda. So I think it's only fitting that 
we now um, move over, give the floor to you to talk about our teaching progress. At the end of the day, it is raising the next generation. It's the um, most important thing. And I cannot see the slides, so uh, I'm going to well, depend on you. Sure. You just, um, huh, hold on one second. Let me get the slides up. Um, all right. Yeah, I've got you, your slides up, Mike. Take it away. All right. Well, I think it'll be pretty straightforward, so I'll, I'll just go through. You know, as Tara mentioned, and as Ann did as well, you know, one of the pillars of a UPC is the educational component, because even if the research is successful, we have to continue this into the future. And as Tara mentioned, there's a bit of a paradigm shift of where we're trying to do more integration and synthesis of information. If we could have the next slide. So what we're really trying to do in CAR-T, CAR-T, of course, is the Center for Advancing Research in Transportation, Energy, Emissions, and Health. And this has served us sort of inherently interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, involving people involved in transportation, air quality, uh, and exposure, public health people as well. And so we did a survey early on in the CAR-T uh, universe of looking at university courses in this area uh, about three and a half years ago. And we found that the courses tended to fall victim to one of two characteristics. The technical courses uh, were not sufficiently broad, and the courses that were sufficiently broad weren't sufficiently technical to really serve as the basis for uh, educating the future generation of leaders in this area. And so we began a number of initiatives. I could have the next slide. Uh, Cartes' initiatives in, in education were focused around a, a wide range of where we could do both outreach and education. Of course, we, as a, a university center, one of our principal cooperative events was the preparation of, of a set of, of materials focusing both on presentation materials as well as textbook development uh, that um, uh, Hanine uh, led along with Joe Zietzman, as well as some supplementary lecture materials. And so the idea of this was to provide a resource for uh, any university that wanted to uh, potentially use information in this area to have sort of pre-made slides, et cetera, and, and resources that they could use for this development. For one of our aspects, we decided to try to pilot such a course uh, to find out what the problems and issues might be. With. And so we began to focus at the senior level, undergraduate level. Uh, it had a several issues associated with it. We wanted a course with very limited number of prerequisites that would allow for the broadest possible range of majors to be represented, but still provide sufficient technical content that we considered a technical elective in an engineering or science or a city planning course. And that rapidly evolved to where there was a need for team teaching, uh, both in terms of understanding the range of issues that we needed to have, but also with a familiarity with what the students knew uh, in different disciplines at various stages of their educational career, uh, so that we would not be at too high or too low a level to be able to handle that effectively. But have the next slide. Of course, we are looking at uh, a variety of different issues. The course was taught at Georgia Tech, as it says, it says senior level special topic uh, twice. It was taught in the spring semester of 2019 uh, for 26 students from five different majors. Uh, civil and environmental engineering, industrial and systems engineering, biomedical engineering, mechanical engineering, and management. In the spring semester of 2020, uh, we taught 31 students with seven different majors. Uh, similar ones, we've added biology, earth and atmospheric sciences, and chemical and biochemical engineering uh, to that list. We had a second student who had a double major in public policy and in city and regional planning. Uh, which also provided a, a different aspect. Now, we had success with the course, and the course ended up being approved in February of 2021 
uh, as a permanent addition to the Georgia Tech curriculum uh, as Civil and Environmental Engineering 4670. And it's, it will be taught in this fall of 2021. We currently have 35 students enrolled, but we're trying to find a location which would support 45 students. And so the course has become rather popular. We have the next uh, slide. I don't want to go into all the details, but I wanted to give you some idea of what we talked about when we said we needed uh, resources associated with it. Uh, the instructors of record were myself and uh, a group of graduate uh, research assistants, uh, most notably David Ederer, uh, who was finishing his PhD uh, at, who was a CDC epidemiologist, uh, who has just recently finished his PhD and actually will be adjoining the EIS class uh, for uh, 2021 here in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we also had a number of guest lecturers on particular topics from CDC and from Andrew Danberg from the uh, University of Washington, uh, as well as my now wife, uh, uh, Sandra Willis, who is a um, health psychologist, as well as Marcus Michael Garber from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. But we also got significant support from other, from a variety of other research faculty. So it kind of shows the level of support that's necessary to prepare and operate such an inter multidisciplinary course. Have the next slide. I'm not going to go through this. It's more for resource. But the idea was to cover all the different areas. This, as uh, was alluded to by Kara and others, we began with a couple of fundamentals. We had seven lectures on air pollution and mobile source emissions and how um, how to estimate those. We focused on uh, on two different emissions modeling systems, the EPA MOVES model, which uh, uh, we developed a pre-run version called MOVES Matrix, uh, and the Georgia Tech Fuel and Emissions Calculator, which was originally developed um, by Georgia Tech and Oak Ridge National Labs for the Federal Transit Administration uh, back when Ann was still at Georgia Tech. And so the uh, the second uh, module, if you wish, was exposure assessment. Uh, that involved six lectures and focused on the use of the EPA air mod system uh, for dispersion modeling. Uh, eight lectures were dedicated uh, to the health impacts associated with air pollution, and six lectures to policies and technologies to mitigate the impact. Now, the focus of the uh, work within the course was besides a series of small quizzes for two uh, projects, we'd have the next slide. The first project was roughly half the course and it involved emissions estimates. Uh, as part of our development of the course, we collected information uh, from an interstate highway uh, over a seven day period uh, at I-475 in near Macon, Georgia, a medium sized uh, city in Georgia of about uh, 400,000 metro area. And that provided second by second uh, vehicle classification across the screen line uh, for this area. First project essentially asked students to take one of these 12 hour periods over the seven days and to estimate the emissions from both light and heavy duty trucks uh, and, be, and motor vehicles that moving along that interstate highway using uh, the EPA moves model uh, and the Georgia Tech Fuel and Emissions Calculator for the heavy duty component. Now that expertise was carried over into the second project, which was actually an exposure and a health impact assessment. Uh, this particular one expanded from the interstate to also include a number of arterial roads. Uh, from these emissions, we asked the students to take uh, a, a one year's worth of uh, meteorological data and estimate exposure from a variety of locations, specifically uh, high-risk areas such as schools, hospitals, nursing homes, and recreation areas. And we used a simple uh, model for both the exposure, with people, residents, and, and visitors to those locations, uh, and a health effect model uh, to estimate what the potential likely health impact, focusing mostly on particulate matter. We have the next slide. Just to show you the area we were modeling, all of the, uh, this is a Google map image of downtown Macon and 
across the Okmulgee River uh, from this particular area. All of the uh, I-16 uh, runs uh, along the river uh, from this particular location, uh, the river shown in the blue. Uh, and from this area, all of the yellow uh, colored arterial roads were, were used for emissions estimates along with I-16. We have the next slide. Now, from those emissions, we were looking at a variety of areas. There were schools. There were seven schools that were specifically looked at, both primary and secondary schools. We have the next slide. We were also looking at four hospitals uh, and clinics that were located sort of in the central part of this area. If I could have the next slide. We also had five nursing homes located within the modeling domain. And in the last uh, slide, we looked at exposure, uh, especially for children at the Old Mogi National uh, Historical Park uh, and for exercise people along the uh, Macon River Walk that essentially parallels uh, the Old Mogi River on the south side. Now, one of the other aspects of being able to use something like the human emissions calculator is it allowed us to not only calculate travel uh, traffic on these arterials, but also uh, to look at the effect of a uh, of an active rail line. There's a Norfolk Southern rail line that essentially um, moves along the northern boundary of the Okmulgee River. And so emissions estimates from uh, a number of unit trains that uh, uh, move through this area uh, normally was done in order to calculate uh, the overall particular emissions. Now, this is a very brief coverage, but the idea was to be able to take these senior students and to have them do both emissions and dispersion estimates, as well as being able to calculate potential human exposures to the concentration field derived from air mod and to estimate what health effects might be, specifically to elderly people in nursing homes and to children uh, either at Oak Moggy or the other. We'd have the last uh, next slide, excuse me. If we were to talk about the conclusions that we drew from the pilot study, is that we found out with sufficient support and expertise that the undergraduate students were able to fairly readily uh, develop expertise that allow them to effectively uh, estimate emissions as well as the dispersion and the use of some fairly simple exposure and, and health impact models allowed us uh, to we take this all the way to what would be sort of a junior version of a health impact assessment. The course was highly rated by students, but of course it represents a very substantial uh, commitment of resources. And we hope to simplify that by sort of uh, boxing up some of these, uh, of these uh, project level studies to show. Now if I could have the last slide here, sort of following on to our observations, associated uh, with these pilot studies. As we mentioned earlier, the course has been improved as a permanent addition to the Transportation Systems Engineering Program uh, in Georgia Tech Civil Engineering uh, for uh, undergraduate civil engineers, uh, as it, it was also approved as a technical elective for all uh, Georgia Tech undergraduate degrees. So as we said, that allows us to have a fairly broad range uh, of potential candidates for uh, taking the course. Uh, Georgia Tech is also in the process of developing a new uh, public health minor uh, that's going to be housed in the health systems engineering program within the industrial systems engineering. And this particular course has been selected as one of the three options for the health and environment portion of this uh, uh, new public health minor. We're also in, currently in the process Development graduate version of the course for entering master's students uh, that will be taught uh, jointly by Georgia Tech and by the Emory uh, School of uh, Rollins School of Public Health, uh, both for uh, public health students uh, as well as for transportation systems engineering and city planning, city and regional planning students here at Georgia Tech. With that, I'll close and uh, turn it back over to Ann. Thank you. That's some very exciting development for the audience that may not know. 
uh, Georgia Tech is where I obtained my PhD. And uh, when I see presentations and progress like this, I couldn't be prouder to say that I'm a yellow jacket. So thank you very much, Mike. Um, okay. There is a question from Mary Fox uh, that I think, um, Mike, you said that the course is very highly rated. Could you give us a more detailed sense of the student feedback? Well, the feedback was is that almost all the students really enjoyed the fact that they could get to a final outcome, you know, that they could sort of directly link uh, what they're learning. In other words, the fact that it's a lot of material was a, a technical demand on them. But students, especially, I think, uh, gifted students, really want to be able to get it all the way to the end. In other words, they want to be able to answer the question, how much did the railway impact of the, uh, these uh, locations versus the arterial roads versus the interstate highway? And are there some times of day that it was a bigger deal? Or how much was episodic? How much was continuous? And being able to sort of play with that uh, in in their own work was uh, was very enjoyable, and uh, as a consequence, we the overall rating. Of course, we're on a five point scale at Georgia Tech, uh, so the rating for technical content was a four point nine, and the course effectiveness was rated as a four point eight. For reference, that's about a point higher than a typical technical elective for a non majors. So. Uh, there seems to be a lot of demand. Of course, there's some self-selection of people who are willing to take a course as a special topic. Um, but nevertheless, we're very encouraged with the idea that such a course can be developed not just at the graduate level, but also for um, for a range of undergraduate majors. Hmm? Well, thank you so much, Mike. 4.9, yeah. That's a, wow. Congratulations. So next... Let's have um, Kanog Borobun Thompson. Um, and he's going to talk about research at UC Riverside about in um, public housing uh, around ports. I'll take it away, Kanog. All right. Thank you, Anne. And hello, everyone. So, yeah, as uh, Tara mentioned, um, yeah, uh, as part of the CARTI uh, consortium, um, each university have uh, supported uh, different research projects, and today uh, I'm going to highlight one of the projects uh, at UC Riverside, and uh, we will be uh, talking about improving public health in disadvantaged communities near ports through truck electrification. Um, and uh, so we, we all realize that transportation can have profound impact on health, right? And uh, Tara mentioned 14 different pathways, and this is one of them. Um, the map that you see is the risk, uh, cancer risk uh, as model for Southern California region. And um, the, the major source of uh, that risk is uh, the mobile emissions. 88% of uh, carcinogenic air toxic emissions uh, in the region are uh, from mobile sources such as cars and es especially trucks uh, and, and ships that use uh, diesel fuel. And uh, if you uh, look at the spot down uh, by, by the uh, ocean, that's where the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach uh, are located. And that's where uh, the air toxic cancer risk is highest. Now, um, Reducing emissions from truck is critical, not, not only for public health reason, but also for uh, climate, right? Uh, at least uh, in the US, 7.5% of total greenhouse gas emission come from uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles or trucks that are mostly used to move freight. And that uh, fraction is projected to grow even larger as a result of uh, increased e-commerce activities. And um, as many of you may know, uh, California uh, has set aggressive uh, zero emission truck sales targets. Uh, this is uh, estimated to be about 4,000 in the next three years and 100,000 uh, in the next 10 years. And because of the current uh, state of technologies, uh, it's expected that most of those zero emission trucks 
at least in the next five uh, to seven years would be battery electric. However, there are still many operational barriers to the adoption of battery electric trucks. Um, so the range is still quite short in compare uh, to uh, in comparison to diesel trucks. Uh, the uh, highest range is about 250 miles uh, right now. And on top of that, the charging time is still taking too long in the order of one hour to one hour and a half or even longer. And uh, when we talk about charging infrastructure, uh, public charging infrastructure for these electric trucks is almost non-existent, uh, if not very limited. Now, um, but yeah, we are making progress, right, towards electrify the truck sector. And um, yeah, for truck sector, there's a wide variety of applications. Um, and among those different applications, drayage uh, seem to be an ideal application for early adoption of battery electric trucks. And, and drayage means uh, these are port trucks that uh, haul container into and out of the ports to nearby warehouses or rail yards uh, to be transported further uh, throughout the country. And this application is ideal in a sense that um, it, the trucks only run limited daily distance uh, and then they get back to home beds every night so they can be charred up. And they spend a, a, a large amount of time just idling, waiting for uh, containers or kind of queuing at the terminal gates. And also, um, as compared to the, pre, the the first map that you see, right, uh, the uh, cancer risk map, most of these trucks operate in uh, disadvantaged communities where uh, there is overburden uh, of uh, environmental pollution. However, not all drayage fleets are operated in the same way. Some fleet uh, operate just one ship. Uh, some, especially in Southern California, operate dual ships. And, and you see that uh, those operating patterns may impact how or uh, whether uh, those fleet can transition to electric fleet. Um, in, in this uh, picture, it showed that uh, for on the left, that is a drayage fleet in Northern California, which operate during the daytime. And uh, the trucks operate mostly near the docks. Uh, so the speed is not as high in the, in the order of 30, 35 miles per hour. On the other hand, uh, on the right hand side is the operating pattern for a drayage fleet in Southern California. And you can see that it's run uh, throughout the day and sometimes get high to uh, get the speed as high as highway speed, so they, they travel further out. And also, um, the, the range that you can get out of an electric truck uh, may vary, right? Uh, the advertised range by manufacturer is for under operate, ideal operating condition, but in real world, um, as your car, uh, or your electric car, you, you will realize that the actual range that you can get will be impacted by many factors. Uh, for trucks, uh, the weight carry is very important. Uh, if it's hauling empty container versus a fully load container, it will have a significant impact on the amount of energy consumed. And then there are so many other factors as listed, as listed on the slide that can also impact the actual range of the truck. And because of this reason, um, for a fleet to be able to determine whether they can uh, transition to uh, an electric fleet, uh, they have to evaluate the operational feasibility of doing so, right? or at least verify that. And um, it would be better if they can do that with the real world operation uh, of their trucks and, and couple that with some sort of uh, energy uh, consumption model for electric trucks. Now, for op uh, operational feasibility evaluation, the fleet uh, will, will, would likely have uh, to assume that uh, the charging station will be uh, situated at the home base, right? So for a truck uh, to be able to get charged, they have to come back to the home base. So the evaluation has to be done at the tour level as opposed to the trip level. Um, and we did that uh, evaluation for one uh, drayage fleet uh, near the port of Los Angeles. 
this fleet operate dual ships and uh, service location in LA Metro as well as the Inland Empire. And uh, we operate it assuming that the fleet would adopt uh, a commercially available battery electric truck at the time of the study, which is a few years ago. And back then the estimated range of that truck is about 150 miles. And uh, this slide shows the statistic of the tour uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the trucks that we collect data from. And these data are collected from, tw from 20 trucks for a period of one week. And you can see that um, the, the range uh, kind of vary uh, greatly. Uh, let's say, for example, two of these tents uh, on average is 60 miles a day, uh, which is uh, 60 miles per tour, which is not bad. Uh, but yeah, it can go as high as double that, right? 120 miles. Now, based on our evaluation of those 20 trucks uh, and, and their uh, actual uh, data, uh, operation data, we found that only 55% of the tours uh, can be performed by battery electric truck, uh, where 11% uh, is just too, uh, the, the distance of that tour is just too far. Uh, much longer than uh, what the range of the truck uh, uh, can allow. And then the other 34%, uh, even though the tour distance uh, is within the range, but because the, the tour is consecutive, right? So the truck doesn't come back at the home base and have enough charging time to charge the battery back to the full charge before it has to take the next tour. And, and that's why these 34% are also not possible. Now, if the fleet take advantage of uh, opportunity charging, and by opportunity charging, uh, I mean, whenever the truck get back to the home bed, and there is a gap, the time gap between uh, the, the, the tour that the truck just completed before and, and before the next tour start, the truck can be charged, and then that will allow it to recoup some uh, battery uh, in order to be used in the next tour. With that, uh, then the number of tours that can be performed by battery electric truck will increase from 55% uh, to 75%. But still, it's not still not 100%. So we will need other technical technological solution to help make it possible for uh, a drayage fleet to fully transition to uh, electric fleet. And that can mean uh, having trucks with longer range, uh, whether it be battery electric or other type of fuel, such as hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, we need a faster, a faster chargers in order to cut down charging time uh, so that truck can be operated uh, in, in uh, consecutively, especially in dual shift. Uh, we may need char new charging technologies, uh, such as wireless charging, uh, that allow trucks to be charged anywhere that, that it may be idling. Um, and we may also need new fleet uh, management system for the fleets uh, that uh, take into account unique characteristic of battery electric trucks. Um, as part of the follow-on study of the first study that we completed, uh, right now we are studying potential of wireless charging for battery electric trucks. Uh, and uh, we look at the potential of doing wireless charging where and when this truck would normally idle, right? Such as queuing at terminal gates or when they are uh, loading or unloading cargoes at warehouses. Those are uh, the time that the truck we have to spend uh, being idle anywhere anyway. And so if we can use that time to charge the truck um, simultaneously, uh, we can uh, reduce the dead head mines that the trucks have to take in order to get to the charging station and also keep the productivity of these trucks uh, at a high level. And of, of course, um, yeah, this is just the beginning uh, uh, and much more research is needed. Um, so uh, there are other things that will be needed in order to make this uh, become reality. Um, so supporting technologies uh, for battery electric truck operations, such as 
new ways of scheduling and dispatching trucks so that they don't run off range. Uh, and then with the charging requirement of this truck, uh, there's also a need for a new charging management system. Um, and I mentioned earlier about charging infrastructure and a planning of uh, how to create or uh, build out that charging infrastructure, especially for, uh, specifically for trucks, uh, we require uh, uh, door of planning, right? Uh, as as uh, Tara mentioned, uh, the integration of transportation network and electrical grid is very important. And that may require public private partnership in order to make that happen. And last but not least, uh, as CAR-T is focused on public health, um, we also have to look at public health and other benefits of truck electrification, uh, ensuring that the deployment of battery electric trucks or zero emission trucks in general uh, is equitable and just, and also uh, kind of try to foresee and protect against any unintended consequences that may arise. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kanok. We're, um, there is a question in the Q&A session for you, Kanuk, if you don't mind um, answering uh, by, by typing up the answer because we're running a bit short on time. So next, we are gonna, um, we have Dr. Wen Wai Li to um, talk about the research at uh, UTEP. So. Well, why the, fl the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wen Wiley. I'm here to report UTEP's progress by summarizing three pieces of research work that are relevant to our overall objective of looking into transportation-related health and air quality issue in the uh, border region. Uh, initially, these are all my colleagues, and in the past two years, many of them departed. Uh, they went to California, New Mexico, and a different city of Texas, Brownsville, and even in the same city, they uh, went to work for UT Health School of Public Health. Uh, but the good thing is we all still collaborate, and we're still doing research together. So let me close the video so I would have a good uh, <clears throat> transition. Let me start with the uh, overall objective. We want to characterize air pollution and associated health risk for sensitive receptors in underserved communities, which is El Paso Juarez region uh, near busy railways. We uh, in the first study, we developed association between various time resolved traffic related air pollutant uh, and respiratory health for children attending near road school. In the second study, we acquired a set of uh, health outcome data, which is cardio respiratory outcome data for low income residents and we perform short-term uh, effect study, and we also perform a long-term effect study uh, to look into the transportation parameters, metabolic symptom risk factors. And lastly, we assess the dust emissions and visibility impacts on highway during dust storms in Southwest US. Okay, I'm gonna move a little faster because I think we're running up out of time. <clears throat> For the background, we all know that residents of underserved communities are likely to be exposed to excessive levels of air pollution. And the uh, statistic I show you in these slides are kind of dated, uh, but at that time, which is many years ago, good percentage, over 65% of African Americans live within 30 miles of coal-fired power plant, and 66% of the Latinos live in areas that do not meet the federal government's air quality standards, and a large household uh, in the U.S. live within 
a short distance, half a block from a four or more lane highway. And uh, also we have performed two separate study in the Paso del Norte region that we look into uh, traffic related pollutant concentration and their association with both airway inflammation and lung function in asthmatic children. Okay, so the first study we look into the asthmatic children in two uh, near road uh, schools, and also we position the reference station right across uh, the busy highway. We also look into uh, four or five uh, TCEQ operated FRM uh, stations. These are the stations shown with the wind roses, so you can see the wind pattern during the study period. Okay, for the air quality study, we look into uh, the air concentration, one hour continuous record of PM 2.5 and PM 10, as well as uh, NO2 and ozone. Uh, for the health outcome study, we, look, we established a cohort of 23 asthmatic children aged from six to 12. We perform a power analysis to make sure the sample, even though it's a small size, uh, but with uh, the increase in the uh, uh, duration, we have enough statistical power to do the analysis. And we perform the exhale nitric oxide study and also the lung function where we measure the full vital capacity and, I mean, forced vital capacity and forced expiratory uh, volume in the first second uh, twice a week. And we also perform asthma, asthma control questionnaire uh, to look for other information. We also perform a physical activity study on the children, which uh, I'm not going to report the outcome of the physical study in this uh, presentation. Here is the uh, air quality data. Uh, we look into the diurnal pattern for the three pollutants, actually four pollutants, if you uh, separate PM 2.5 from PM 10. And uh, for one site, we expect uh, we run into unexpected high concentration of PM10, and the result is because there's bare soil nearby the facilities. And also we run into some wind erosion scenario during the study. And we have seen the uh, moderate to high spatial, spatial hectare <clears throat> genicity in the NO2 concentration among various sites. But for ozone concentration, as you can see at the uh, bottom right corners, uh, ozone collected from the uh, near row sites as well as the reference sites throughout the city, they collapse very well. So there is a ubiquity uh, in the air for ozone distribution, which is more homogeneous, so to speak. Uh, the, on the contrary, PM pollution uh, does show the spatial variation, and you can see uh, PM pollution differ from uh, different locations, and we actually perform different uh, Spearman analysis and also the uh, coefficient of divergence analysis to look into the homogeneity uh, distribution of the data. So we found there is a strong association among regions ozone level, uh, moderate for NO2, uh, but weak for PM for intrasite uh, analysis from the uh, intrasite analysis. We also found strong association between PM10 and PM2.5 as expected and in El Paso, which is different from some major cities in other part of the country, PM 2.5 accounts for only about a quarter of PM 10, which is quite different from other city. 
Okay, let me move on. Uh, for the uh, health outcome study, we perform health uh, outcome questionnaire for different variables. Uh, we found interesting results that there's a high percentage of asthmatic children having siblings or parents with asthma, allergy, or hay fever. So it's probably more in the gene. Uh, we found there's a longitudinal association between primary responses, which is excel nitric oxide, uh, forced vital capacity, and FEV1, and air pollution metrics. Uh, we use the linear mixed effects model, and we also model the uh, uh, fixed effects and subjects and subjects uh, as random effect. Okay, uh, one interesting study we result outcome we discovered was in the previous study we were able to find there's a strong association between PM 2.5 as well as PM course or PM 10 with uh, lung function uh, and so is break carbon. But in this study, we could not uh, reach the same conclusion. Actually, it's a very weak association. And finally, if we figure out the reason is if you look uh, at the data, PM data collected during the study, the, the one with high PM uh, health effects or with uh, strong association are from school in Ciudad Juarez, which you have a much higher exposure concentration as um, marked in yellow compared to other studies, our PM10 as well as PM2.5 levels are much lower than uh, the, the uh, concentration at that time in Juarez. And more up, uh, in addition, I guess in the US, uh, children tend to be under uh, asthma medication. So their asthmatic symptom can be suppressed because of the medication. And that could be the reason to obscure the uh, health outcome. Okay, the uh, second study, we're looking to the association of uh, health measurement with the first, for the short term, we look into the air pollution exposure. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about this one because it is presented by Juan Aguilera in a separate session. Uh, for the long-term uh, association, this is what I want to report. We look into five years of health outcome data with four, near 5,000 participants. We uh, try to associate the cardiovascular health outcome with uh, the transportation data. Now, for the cardiovascular outcome, we define the metabolic syndrome risk factors uh, as a uh, indicator for that. And these are the risk factors uh, characterized by the parameters as waistline, blood pressure, HDL cholesterol level and triglyceride level and fasting glucose, uh, blood glucose. And we have a cutoff value. If a participant exceeds three of the cutoff values, then we uh, classify the person with metabolic syndrome and which is associated with cardiovascular uh, risk. And for the study to for the transportation predictors uh, variables, we first define a zone, actually we define two zones, 500 meter and 1000 meter. And within the zone, we look into uh, four variables. First, the distance to major arterial road. As a matter of fact, we have variance for this variable. We also look into the distance, inverse of the distance square or inverse of the distance. And we look into the length of the street within the zone we defined. And we look into the distance to the port of entry and also the uh, uh, traffic volume within the defined zone based on the 
uh, GIS layer from El Paso Metropolitan uh, Printing Organization. Okay, so finally, uh, we use a logistic regression model to include three primary uh, traffic variable for METs. And you can see that the red region represent uh, areas uh, people may have a higher metabolic symptom, symptom risk. And these are, you can see that it's along the major interstate highway or, and also in the very densely populated area in El Paso. Okay, my last uh, study, we look into the uh, uh, effect of dust emission from uh, desert to uh, interstate highway. This was presented by Dr. Tom Gill in another session. So let me just summarize his work. Uh, we model the emissions from a, uh, a prayer. We use the uh, uh, USDA's emission model, and we also model the emission using a typical uh, EPA regulatory air mud model. And we discovered that during a dust storm, the concentration of particulate matter could be into the 100 milligram per cubic meter range. And that would certainly obscure vis visibility and create health risk. Okay, so in summary, let me, uh, let me cut it short. So I still have some time for Mary. So we say that the short-term change in uh, traffic-related criteria pollutant were weakly associated with pulmonary inflammation and lung function in asthmatic children. The only positive association we discovered was a 72-hour ozone average, that is 72 hours from the, uh, the time when the uh, ozone, the uh, ENO measurement was conducted. So the 72 hours prior to the measurement. Uh, so this is an indication, maybe gaseous pollutant in this case could be more uh, associated with children's uh, health effect. And an interesting outcome we discovered is the health insurance and cooking fuel were both significant factor to modify the PM effect on decreased lung function. For the metabolic symptom as an indicator for cardiovascular uh, respiratory effect risk, we say that the length of street associated with uh, metabolic symptoms, this is a stronger predictors. The traffic volume and proximity to the Port of Authority also uh, related to the post blood pressure. So that's a sidekick of the data we found. And proximity to port of entry negatively associated with fasting glucose. And this could be a social justice issue or a cultural issue. Uh, the length of the street predicted high risk in metabolic risk factors, uh, which would an indication of the five parameters, uh, large waistline, high triglyceride, and low HDL cholesterol. Well, the, the primary three would be waistline, uh, tri level of triglyceride, and the cholesterol level. And for the dust emission, PM emission during dust storm could severe impact of visibility, safety, and health of the drivers. So with that, I'm going to stop now, and uh, I guess I'll let people ask questions if we still have time. Thank you, Wenwai. Thank you so much. We are running uh, behind schedule. The, the session will continue to run even after our allotted time. So please do stay for Mary's presentation. And um, for Q&A, we won't have time to have a session Q&A. So please uh, find our uh, speakers at either the lounge or by email afterwards. Thank you. And Mary, uh, please go ahead.
Great, thanks so much. I, I know I'm, I'm standing between you and our break for today. So please bear with me for a little while. Um, what I want to talk about today kind of links back to our um, our keynote from this morning. And I noticed one of the questions that came up um, related to how how does public health, you know, sort of help with these community level, um, you know, air air pollution activities. And I, what I'm going to try to do is, is hopefully show you a little bit of what that means in a, in a very practical sense. Um, and this is work in progress that I am sharing. Uh, some of our other research from Johns Hopkins that has been part of CAR-T will, will be appearing in other sessions. So Tara set us up very nicely in talking about um, our work uh, in press about the 14 pathways to help. Um, and the work that Hopkins is doing this year with CAR-T, uh, there's sort of a constellation of activities that um, uh, largely draw on this 14 pathway concept, um, but also contribute to the larger um, SMART initiative uh, of CAR-T, which links into the infrastructure planning uh, themes. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these, but first I want to um, introduce three public health methods that are being applied. Uh, and these come from uh, the environmental health side, which is my area of expertise, and also just our very basic, uh, very traditional community health practice. But let's start here with the concept of cumulative risk assessment, which is an environmental health policy tool. And it was defined by the Environmental Protection Agency as the combined risks from aggregate exposures to multiple agents or stressors. Uh, and if you look at the little figure we have here on this slide, the, you know, the, the overlapping circles kind of capture this cumulative risk concept. So the idea is, um, you know, we're, we're not just concerned about air pollutants. Um, we're also concerned about uh, exposures and risk factors that occur in other, uh, other settings, other domains of life. And actually, Wenwei talked a little bit about this and, and their work at UTEP um, related to the schools is very much sort of in line with this activity where, um, you know, we, we want to understand not just what's happening in terms of air, but how that also interacts um, you know, with the other sort of quote unquote, you know, environments that we all occupy. So that's our, our first method. And it's a core one that we're applying actually in, in several of our projects. The second method uh, is the kind of very traditional community health assessment, which is, an, which is a, you know, aggregating the health statistics for a particular community or, or area. Um, and it very much involves, um, you know, outreach and, and communication and kind of being in touch with the particular, uh, you know, whatever community uh, you're concerned with. Um, and so you look at health status and you look at, um, you know, some of the basic demographic characteristics and you, you really try to get a picture of you know what's happening in this in this place um, and I'm going to come back to this idea of um, there's sort of you know there's the top down and kind of the bottom up approaches right um, so we can look at emissions and do research that uh, evaluates emissions as it relates to asthma cardiometabolic outcomes um, but what community health assessment does is kind of um, come up from the bottom, 
that uh, and links to sort of roots the um, you know whatever we might be looking at emissions or whatever other uh, stressor we might be concerned about and actually you know tries to link it and root it to what is really happening with health in this particular place. So that's um, kind of a very traditional type of community health assessment approach. And the third method that we're exploring as part of our work with CARSI this year is health impact assessment. Um, and, and when I say health impact assessment, what I'm meaning is the six step process that I'm showing on the slide. Uh, it's a stakeholder engagement process and it looks at particular you know, decisions be it, you know, maybe it's a, a new infrastructure project, maybe it's a new uh, community center being built, um, or a playground, uh, or some, you know, some other new feature that's proposed for a community. And the idea behind health impact assessment, this six step stakeholder process, is to look at that particular policy, whatever new thing is coming from all of the different aspects that may relate to health and provide recommendations that maximize health benefits and minimize risks. So, you know, one of the concerns we often hear um, from, from our transportation colleagues or, you know, colleagues in any other sector is that, um, you know, they're they're leery of linking into public health because, because um, you know, they're concerned we're just gonna say, well, there are too many health impacts. You can't do what you wanna do. And that's not what health impact assessment is about. Health impact assessment is about this maximization, right? How do we get the best out of whatever new project is coming and minimize what might be um, the negative aspects. So we're also going to explore um, this process of, of health impact assessment um, as a tool to help us and help CAR-T going forward. So now let me talk a little bit about kind of this, the constellation of projects that we are working on this year. So the first one, builds on work that has been done previously uh, within TTI in partnership with uh, Dr. Teresa Pembroke at GP Red. And there was a, they did a pilot study of uh, long haul truck drivers looking at their, um, their use of a particular truck stop and the benefits and um, sort of the, the features that they were looking for um, in this particular truck stop because, you know, long haul truck drivers are a transient community. They look for particular services when they stop. Um, and that very much kind of links to our uh, cumulative risk concept if we focus on kind of uh, long haul truckers as as workers within our transportation system. So um, there's been some recent work out of Texas A&M, um, not TTI actually, but, but another part of the university, uh, looking at occupational health of drivers and suggesting that, um, you know, the drivers experience a really a somewhat unique constellation of health stressors. Um, and so our concept paper is trying to take that sort of one more step and say the cumulative risk assessment framework can be a very useful tool to um, implement, sort of to, to actually kind of get at and explore uh, and research that problem. So that's one of the projects that we're working on this year. The second one relates also ongoing work, um, relates to uh, 
the technology product that CAR-T has built. And here we're just sort of providing some additional technical assistance to try to expand the utility of the model. Um, so uh, with our colleague, Kirsten Kohler at Hopkins, um, we're exploring the other types of health outcomes we may be able to link in and add to uh, the Tempo model. And looking forward, we hope to build in more of the equity piece, sort of can we um, add to the model ways that account for uh, vulnerable or, or sensitive populations. So look for that work going forward. And now moving on to the exploration of health impact assessment. So for this project, we are going to be mining data that exists um, at uh, the Pew Trust, where they have a, uh, a database in their health impact project of um, the health impact assessments that have been done in the United States over the past 15 years or so. And I don't know if you can see this figure very well, it is a little small, and I apologize for that, but if uh, you can see that transportation is actually the second kind of most popular or most common um, topic that has been addressed in health impact assessment. So we're going to try to synthesize um, the evidence in that database uh, using the 14 pathway concept. And this, this project is a little bit more uh, research oriented. So we're trying to validate or, or ground truth the 14 pathway concept within transportation practice and policy. And we're going to be using the um, existing HIAs that are in the Health Impact Project database. So about 130 transportation um, HIAs have been done. Um, a smaller number of those have an outcome statement. So that's the important piece of the HIA where we can explore how health kind of influenced the particular direction of the transportation decision-making that was done. Um, fortunately though, even though it's a relatively smaller number that have the outcome statement, um, it is quite broadly distributed across the United States. So I think we are going to learn quite a lot about both how health impact assessments work in the transportation and policy decision-making space. And uh, we're going to learn a lot about how the 14th pathway co concept really works in practice. And lastly, really the larger project uh, of the set that we're doing uh, is a community engagement project. And again, partnering with uh, Dr. Teresa Penbrook at GP Red and colleagues at TTI, um, looking at the Port of Houston area. So you may have guessed by now that looking at communities around ports is an important uh, theme <laughs> of the CAR-T work. Um, and Hopkins is going to be involved in the Port of Houston effort. Um, and we're going to be applying the 14 pathway conceptual model again. We're going to be uh, reaching out to communities in a mixed method study where we will be doing interviews and focus groups, as well as analyzing the community health data, as I mentioned, um, and other uh, air pollution data sets. And I will um, just take a minute to note the, the um, image on this slide very similar to um, the slides that Canuck was showing us a few minutes ago about the ports um, in Southern California. But this is actually a, uh, this is taken from a study of the Houston area. Um, and it shows the cancer risk from air toxics that tracks with the Houston ship channel. And just sort of to, to reiterate the, um, the really important contribution of ports and shipping to 
uh, air emissions and the community health impacts. And this is older data from a study from, from 2008, but the more recent air toxics data um, is very much consistent with this. So there's still a uh, high risk from air toxics for those communities along the ship channel. So wrapping up now, and thank you all for sticking with me for a few more minutes. So um, we're engaged in developing and expanding concepts and methods that CAR-T has been working on for some time. Um, what the work we're doing is very much applied and uh, targeted at, uh, at public health practice and decision making. And you know we're we're trying to do the sort of the ground up, as I mentioned before, sort of what is happening in these communities, for example, the uh, communities around the Port of Houston and, and the Ship Channel. What are the health concerns there? What are the health statistics there? And how does that relate to what we're talking about? What has been our focus of CAR-T, which is the emissions on health. Um, and I think it's gonna be a very fruitful sort of, uh, you know, connection um, and kind of way forward in terms of infrastructure planning and decision making. So just to wrap up, so the public health approach, particularly um, frameworks like cumulative risk assessment are very much systems oriented. Um, and, you know, dealing with our real lives, which cross many different domains, um, not just the ambient environment, but also personal environments, work environments, et cetera. Um, and I really like the 14 pathway concept because it does capture both the pros and the cons, right? So there, there's some very important services and uh, health benefits that we attain from our transportation system. In addition to the concerns that we have for uh, health damaging exposures and safety. Um, but the only way we can really get at the types of decisions that will change these systems is if we look at things more holistically altogether. So that's what we're trying to do and trying to contribute to the work of CAR-T this year. Thanks so much for sticking with me. And uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to email. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you so much, everyone, um, for joining us for this session. As you can see, we do have a lot going on within CAR-T in terms of research and education, and uh, there's a strong collaboration across all the institutions. We would love to hear from you on what you would like to see out of our research and how to get engaged um, with communities and translate our research to policy and to practice. With that, thank you very much. And we uh, love to see you out, um, every, at, uh, during the rest of our symposium. Thank you. <laughs>